So, um, you know, a lot of the data sharing stuff that was important in my life really started with the Genome Project and the, the drive to have an international team of investigators be able to share data in real time. And so the Bermuda rules were put in place and basically said once you had an assembly of so long, you had 24 hours to get it out there for any researcher anywhere in the world to be able to access. And it was pretty dirty data, but it was nonetheless uh, an early effort that um, riled a lot of people up. I mean, it wasn't an easy, an easy move. Since the Bermuda rules were put in place and the Genome Project was completed, any number of genomes have been sequenced. Um, and I would like to tell you a story about one genome in particular, and that's the genome of HeLa cells. And I do that because this story and this genome um, were really important in catalyzing some really critical policy, um, policies that I will tell you about. So you guys all know the story of Henrietta Lacks, and in fact, when I visited SAGE a few months ago, I shared, them, uh, shared with them this story, and that was part of the motivation for sharing it with you all today. Um, Henrietta um, cells were harvested from her without her knowledge or permission, and this guy, whose name was George Guy, um, managed to get those cells to grow in culture, and when he died, there was an obituary written about him by three guys, um, and their names are interesting. So the first is uh, Victor. Uh, the first is um, Howard Jones. You guys know who Howard Jones is. He's the father of IVF. Um, and then the second guy here is Victor McCusick, and he's the father of human genetics, both from Hawkins. Um, the third guy, I don't know, but he was certainly the father of something. <laughs> um, and later, uh, so what's interesting in this um, uh, tribute is, um, and I can't read this uh, without my glasses. Okay. It has been often said that scientific discovery results when the right man is in the right place at the right time. So that certainly was true uh, during this period of time and, and persists even today. Um, later, Victor McCusick wrote a paper in which he uh, published some HLA markers and a pedigree um, of the Lacks family. What I failed to mention is in that obstetrics and gynecology paper, um, Henrietta Lacks was identified, um, a massive breach of privacy. Um, we all know the book written by Rebecca Skloot, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. If you haven't read it, you should. It's a great, it's a great tale. Um, so in March of 2013, I got a call from Rebecca um, telling me that this German team had sequenced a HeLa cell line and had posted on EBI, and it was mirrored on NCBI, and um, the social media at the time was sort of blowing up. Um, and we didn't fund that. We, the NIH, didn't fund that uh, sequence, and we didn't really have any control over it, but it was clearly an untenable situation, and we needed to step in and do something about it, uh, and so we did. So I asked uh, Rebecca to introduce us to the family, us being Francis Collins. Uh, he's a bright white guy, tall. Um, and, uh, and she did, um, and she wrote this editorial in the New York Times, and and talked about how this one family um, might be able to catalyze really significant policy change, and she was right. They did. Um, so at the time that this sequence was published, we sort of had this collision of values of data sharing and protecting individual privacy, and so we sort of had this um, situation. <laughs> I made myself laugh on the plane when I was making that. <laughs> but it really did spark a solution to the, the present problem, which is what, what should we do, um, and then also catalyze broader uh, policy development. So we, uh, Rebecca introduced us to the family and helped through some friends at Hopkins to get us together, and we had the opportunity to have dinner over a number of weeks with many, many members of the Lacks family, and it was an extraordinary experience, um, one of the most extraordinary experiences of my professional and personal life. And as a result of that, we got to talk to each other 
and we talked for hours and hours and hours and hours. And we really wanted to understand what the family's concerns were and what the family's desires were um, and how we might move forward. And they were genuinely and passionately interested in, as one family member said, having HeLa cells out there working. They wanted these cells to be contributing to science, but they didn't want to keep on being surprised. It was like, surprise, we just learned this and you weren't at the table. Surprise, we just learned this, you weren't at the table. So we um, managed to work through an agreement with them. Um, and, and even the conversations leading towards the agreement were really pretty profound. So for example, um, we knew, because we're both geneticists, that the HeLa sequence revealed that there was a part of the human papilloma virus inserted adjacent to the proto-oncogene MYC, and that that was a likely cause of her very aggressive form of cervical cancer. And we got to share that with the family, which was extraordinary, right? Anyway, we reached an agreement. Um, at the same time, there was another paper by Jay Shinduri just up the road at UW um, on another sequence, and he actually described the HPV insertion uh, in great detail. So the agreement was one of respect of um, knowing. So the family's at the table. They know what research is going to be done um, with these sequences, and then there's been an agreement to basically keep them in the loop about what we learn from HeLa cells more broadly. Um, so that was really important. And um, this is a picture of Francis taking a picture of three of the members of the um, Lax family. And so I guess that's a themmy, because I took that picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Jerry Lax, who was in this last picture, so Jerry is the young woman uh, between Francis and David. Um, she said, in the past, the Lax family has been left in the dark. We're excited to be a part of an important HeLa science, of the important HeLa science to come. So that was really terrific. And in fact, um, it catalyzed the NIH and enabled the NIH to put out a really important policy about genome data sharing that I frankly think would not have come out in the absence of this event with the Lax family. Um, we also, um, we're working on what do we do about consent, and people have been talking about consent throughout this meeting. It's really impossible to know in advance what all wonderful things might be done using data from an individual human, um, and so it's hard to lay those all out in advance, and IRBs at the time were very uncomfortable with broad consent, the government uh, office that's responsible for these sort of things, uh, wasn't really providing much guidance. And so we were um, looking at this as if we're going to do large-scale genomics, like all of us, what do we need to do in order to have a balance of sharing data and privacy? And interestingly, uh, at the very beginning of the Obama administration, um, senior-level people in the White House wanted to revise the common rule, recognizing that it was really quite long in the tooth. Um, it had been written at a different time uh, when paternalism was uh, rampant in biomedical research, and sequencing technology didn't exist, EMRs didn't exist, um, the internet didn't exist, and so we really wanted to propose these updates based on that, and we got really far down the road really, really quickly, and then hit a bureaucratic snag like you would not believe. And if we were not being streamed, I'd name names and tell tales, but we're being streamed, so I won't. Um, talk to me at the party. Um, so, um, so I think it would have died, uh, completely died, if it had not been for the, the Lax family really breathing life into this issue. Um, but at the same time, we were afraid it would never get across the finish line, so we sat down and said, okay, what are the things that we really want to accomplish in the common rule revision that we could just do by grants policy at NIH? And so we did a bunch of stuff. Uh, importantly, um, we put together a single IRB policy, which was later mirrored in the common rule, uh, because everybody really loves uh, working with many, many, many IRBs. <laughs> so um, I want to point out the date 
in when the common rule revisions were finalized. So this is the day before, two days before the Women's March. <laughs> right? I mean, this is incredible. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. And so if you walk away with nothing at all from what I'm talking about, it's timing and passion and strategery. That's what makes the difference. So I want to turn really quickly to talk a little bit about data sharing and clinical research. So the clinical research system is totally messed up, lots of problems, a lot of people working on solutions to various parts of these problems. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the data issue. This is, um, this is Harlan Krumholtz and his colleagues' data from a long time ago, but it's just so riveting of how so many clinical trials uh, data never saw the light of day. And um, there were evangelists out there, um, some in this room, who were really trying to push towards the, the obligation and the many reasons why there should be an obligation to get that data out there. And there, the history here is that there was very clear expectation on Congress's part um, before I went to the office of the director at NIH in 2007, and yet there's this long gap, and in that gap, in the middle there, there was a lot of bickering, and a lot of the bickering was about, it's mine, not yours, not ours, um, but we finally got that policy across the finish line. Um, and um, the, uh, so turning back to timing means everything, the other thing that happened just before the end of the Obama administration was the signing of the 21st Century Cures Act, and somebody else mentioned some of the aspects of the, I think it was Ken, um, some aspects of the 21st Century Cures Act that are so important, and there's a ton of yummy stuff in that bill, just tons and tons and tons. But I wanted to focus on a couple of things that are in that bill. So this bill was signed into law on December 14th. It was the last bill that President Obama signed into law, and I had the great pleasure of being there. I actually took the picture in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and I wanna tell you about a couple things that were included in there that are relevant to the policy issues that are before us today. So one of them was that it enabled, it, it mandated that NIH go an extra step in terms of protecting the privacy of information that's collected by researchers by basically requiring, not putting the obligation on you to ask for one, but basically giving you a certificate of confidentiality if you're doing research with large numbers of people. Lawyers will bicker about how strong certificates of confidentiality are, but the court cases up until now and the anecdotal experiences suggest that they actually do protect from the compelled disclosure of personal identifying information by researchers and their institutions to law enforcement and other others. Um, so that was one thing that was really great. The second thing, and these are in three succeed, succeeding sections, the second is that it provides a protection for individually identified in, in, and identifiable information held by the NIH from release under FOIA. And you would think, well, of course it wouldn't be released under FOIA, FOIA's Freedom of Information Act. Um, but in fa fact, in the case of Henry, the HeLa genome, both the University of Washington and NIH got FOIA requests, which we successfully fought off for release of that sequence. Um, and then the third one was it basically tells NIH that it has the authority um, to demand data sharing f for research that it funds. So um, this is really sort of a turning point now. Um, I've been sort of optimistic about the policy trajectory and the pace and um, outcomes and I think impacts, although somebody should study that more. But here we are today, and I guess I'm gonna turn from a, a half full to a half empty uh, view. So this is, the, this is a general timeline of what has happened at NIH broadly with data sharing. Not genome data, not clinical trial data, but data data. And you can see that the policy that is currently in place was put in place in 2003. What happened in 2003? Well, Finding Nemo came out. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
The human genome was sequenced or announced that it was sequenced. Bush declared mission accomplished um, and the Challenger accident happened. That was a really long time ago. It was a really long time ago and that policy has not evolved really at all since. It requires that you have a plan and that you submit that plan when you submit your application. I did this. I plan on publishing my great data. Right? That's what people put in as a plan. Um, and the plan was not scored in peer review. Um, open access happened. Heather can, can talk about that. I'm sort of just putting it there as a marker because I'm not going to talk about it. And then there's all these things that happen. There's working groups of the advisory committee to the NIH director. There's memorandum coming out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. There's plans. There's proposals. There's strategic plans, there's requests for comments on new plans, and really um, nothing has happened. And, and I, that is why I think that we are at a moment. So NIH put out in October a proposal-ish for data sharing, a new data sharing policy. Anybody comment on it? Show of hands. Anybody even know about it? I mean, the, the, I, it, okay, Shh. <laughs> breathing deeply. <laughs> so now I'm going to turn to something else. And I was talking to Christine about this at lunch. Um, I had the great fortune to go on a business trip with my husband. We've been married for 26 years. This is the first time I went on a business trip with him. And he was reporting on telescopes. And so we went to a uh, mountain called Cerro Tololo in Chile and um, got to be up there for the total eclipse of the sun. So this is a picture taken by my new best friend, Deb, who I met going up to the top of the mountain. <laughs> um, that telescope there is an optical telescope called Gemini. Its sister lives in um, Hawaii and um, I learned a ton about how these astronomers, I don't understand anything about astronomy, but I learned a ton about what astronomers do with data. They have this culture of not just shared data, but of shared facilities. So astronomers get to come up there and do their, ask their question, but all of this is done under a rubric of a big community enterprise. So we went there, saw that telescope, saw another telescope that's being built, um, an optical telescope, went up to 17,000 feet and saw a whole bunch of radio telescopes. They have their policies. NASA has policies about how we um, keep data, especially from Hubble. Um, we don't have anything comparable in the life sciences and particularly in biomedicine. We don't have anything that's comparable. And what's at stake here is understanding the origins of the universe. But what's at stake for us is our own species and our own well-being and our family's health. So um, with that, I will say that we, and somebody made a uh, comment about we shouldn't use the word transformative, and I meant to fix my slide so that I wouldn't say that word. But um, I think that we have this opportunity now to work as a community to really think about what are gonna be the, the big wins from a policy perspective. What are the challenges that all of us are facing or other programs that you all are involved in and how can we work collectively um, to make things better uh, for science to move more smoothly and for uh, patients and participants to be true partners in that enterprise. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and I, I don't know how we're doing on time, Sarah. We're good on time. So um, thank you, and then I, we can take some questions or comments. Does anybody have a question for Kathy? I see one hand right there. I'm a runner. Thanks, Robert. Hi, Kathy. Good to see you. Hi, Camille. Um, you know, you describe all that NIH has been doing, and, and NIH is structured and bureaucratic, and it's been kind of like the behemoth of funding research. 
for as long as I know, except things have changed not since 2003, but since 2010 even, and in just the last three years. Um, so the tech companies are becoming the biomedical research engine. They don't have these rules. Open science is changing. It's, it's unregulated. Anybody can be involved in this. So how do you see this regulatory framework changing or being adopted or um, being useful as we move forward in this kind of different space? Yeah, I, I um, tweeted earlier today of an article from STAT from a few weeks ago in which it has a number of the personal genome companies who banded together to hire a lobbyist to work with the Hill on privacy policy. And that's well within their right, and if I worked for them, I would do that too. But we don't have a similar sort of group of people who are thinking strategically. I mean, we could probably like employ the last panel to do a lot of this work for us, right? I mean, it, 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 there is a lot of opportunity to shape, to move and shape policy. And I don't think that we have we have made as big of a dent in that yet as we might. And so certainly Facebook and Google and 23andMe, they're all, uh, they've got their, their people with boots on the ground, on the hill, in the agencies, submitting comments on proposals, and so we need to be there too. Hi. Um, I, my question is sort of hopefully asking something about policy potential with respect to supporting sort of the increasing role of community control over data as well as sort of the um, desire to govern oneself sort of future work and research as well as community-led and community-based research um, in this space. And I'm wondering what do you foresee as either obstacles or potential solutions to enable that shift to happen um, as something that might um, develop more and more in the coming decades. And can you say who you are, because I can't oh, see Oh, it's you. June Ho Yu. We met a little bit earlier today, June. Yeah. We went to college together at different times. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I think, that's a, I think that's a really great question, and I think that there's people in the room who are probably better equipped to speak to it than than I am. I think that there are um, communities where the, um, the processes for being able to come up with a, a community viewpoint or a community guidance for that community's members or a way of getting input into the design and implementation of research is more worked out than in other communities. So I don't know how you, I, I frankly don't know how you I'm sure it's possible, but I don't know how you appropriately recognize individual autonomy and community inputs in appropriately. So I, I think this is a, a great area for us to explore. I, I frankly don't know um, the, the answer. You can over here. Hey, Kathy, great presentation. Hey. Peter Goodhand, Global Alliance. In, on your last point about learning from the astronomy, community. We've got this fledgling initiative, it's now another three-letter acronym, GBC, Global Biodata Coalition. I wondered if you're aware of it and if you think we, we need to ramp that up or if it's going down the wrong approach. I do not know enough about it to be able to comment, but I think, you know, looking at those kinds of initiatives and looking, I don't know enough about astronomy either, but I was so <laughs> inspired by by what I was learning when I was out there. I just think there's an opportunity here for us to look at some good models and some maybe some efforts that have been undertaken that have been sort of less effective. Okay. Hi, Kathy. Thanks. That was great. Jane. Oh, hi. How are you? Good. Um, I'm curious, because you alluded to this in the, the astronomy community, but um, I was on a review recently for a rather large, many, many groups brain project. Yeah. Not 
US-based necessarily. And um, one of the big comments that came through from somebody really senior was, why is it taking the brain community so long to begin to pull together so many different types of groups to do this kind of thing when the genomics community figured this out two decades ago? Now, from the, you know, obviously you were on the front line um, involved in all of that. I think there are probably some really important lessons that can be shared from that experience on top of astronomy that people who are trying to do these kind of things right now don't actually know about whether they're in the brain community or whether they're in, I don't know, some other area of life sciences. So I wonder if it might be time for you and others to begin to share what were the things that worked and what were the things that didn't so that we cannot reinvent those wheels. Yeah, you know, I, I'd make a couple observations. Um, one is that at least initially in the early days of genome data sharing, the data was pretty simple, right? It's a bunch of A's, T's, C's, and G's. So, um, and in <laughs> neuroscience, I think people are still asking the question, I think Christine raised this this morning, what's the data? Um, and, and then um, data collection and curation requires energy and it requires resources. And so there's decisions to be made around that. You know, the brain initiative, the, the U.S brain initiative is now in its second wave. So it was, you know, when I was involved in it, it was 2020, and now they're putting together the new plan. I haven't stayed super, and I haven't been at all involved in it, but I think in this plan, there really does need to be a real focus on sustainable data sharing and open science. Um, the other thing I'll share with you that I just think is so fascinating, and maybe there, these people can help us tie these things together, there are two high net worth individuals who are really, really into neuroscience and astronomy. Paul Allen and, I'm forgetting the name of the other guy. <laughs> but, it's, it, but it's fascinating that those two things have fascinated right. pe you know, people. And so there's something similar in there somewhere yeah. uh, in terms of the mystery and complexity and awe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's a, an important. And if you man, if you can if you can tackle data sharing and neuroscience and the brain initiative, you know that's that's going to be awesome. Well, we're trying to do it, but we're working with people who didn't actually know there was a Bermuda meeting and Bermuda principles that were generated. Well, they need to come sit on my porch, and I'll sit exactly. <laughs> Justin, and then I think we have time for one more. I saw someone's hand on that side of the, oh, all right, two quick <laughs> ones. Uh, thanks, talk, uh, great, great talk, Kathy. Um, my question, um, well, one of the themes we've heard um, throughout the day is the tension between respect for the individual and thinking about data at large and aggregated data. And I'm curious if you can comment on um, the agreement and solution that you had with the Gila family, the Lacks family, um, and how that scales when you talk about thousands of cell lines that, of course, yeah. exist. So, so it doesn't scale at all. But the, their family is unique because there really is no other cell line where the, the source of the cell line is known and didn't consent, and it's, the, it's everywhere, right? And... Um, the other cell line, I'm not gonna remember the name, but it was a, um, a woman who was a nun um, and her cells are everywhere. She doesn't have presumably any offspring, so there's not existing alive family members who could be impacted by the knowledge of what's in that genome. But what I think moving forward and what was so transformative about the common will changes is that it does allow broad consent. So you can, if you wanted to participate in all of us, you or another research program, you can provide your broad consent saying, you know what, take it, be careful with it, don't be dumb, um, but, but, but make it work. Do something useful and valuable and kind with it. So um, I think that there are many of us who would be happy to provide 
that kind of um, permission. There are other people who are not there, and there are certainly communities who need um, us to show that we can be trustworthy and probably have policies in place that enforce that trustworthiness. So um, informed consent and uh, institutional review boards are the system we have in place now to protect patients uh, with their clinical data. It's far from a perfect system, but uh, what could we do to improve that system and maybe expand it to cover other types of data with citizen advocates and patient advocates included to sign off on uh, what constitutes a true informed consent? How could that system be improved? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a, a lot that we've learned lately, although I don't think we are quite there about um, how to have public and patient partners participating in reviews, design, um, consent development on IRBs. You know, there's a required one public member on uh, IRBs, but that doesn't really cut it. So I think there's a lot of work that we can do there. The other thing is somebody earlier today um, spoke about um, restricting the transmission of data or regulating the transmission of data is one approach, but preventing its misuse is probably an even more effective approach. And I think that's something that we haven't spent a lot of time on since you know, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, frankly. So I think both of those things can be up, up regulated. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's what we got to do as a, as a community. Christine. We have the last question. Um, having spent the last 10 years deeply engaged with my astronomy colleagues on infrastructure, I can say, yes, there's lessons learned, but before you feel like it's too much of a, a half-empty glass, they have been wrestling with competing embargo periods, what part of the pipeline is actually open and what's closed. NASA has very different requirements in the NSF. Our yep. U.S. colleagues are in competition with European colleagues who don't have to share their data when they have to share their data. Yeah. You've got decades of private funding from Keck and Carnegie and Sloan where the investigators absolutely own their data forever and a day, and you will never see those data again. They're being collected again. So you're telling me it's not Nirvana? It is, but the, it is not, but the, no, but I'm saying it's not Nirvana, but there's. But it's so pretty. <laughs> I know, and I got to take a selfie inside the Keck telescopes ah. with these people, and, there's, and it feels like Nirvana, but they got a few problems. Yeah, too. well, you know, the other thing, and this is another talk entirely, um, but the other thing, astronomy's got a big, big, big diversity problem. So uh, we saw one female, um, we saw one female. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> please right. join me in Thank thanking you Kathy everyone. <laughs>